Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to Leading Our Own Way. We're up to part three of this week's episode of the show. We're diving even deeper into our conversation with this week's guest. Let's continue exploring their inspiring journey. If you've missed part one and two, definitely go back and catch up. Also, if you're not subscribing, please, please subscribe. Enjoy the rest of the show. See you soon. <laughs> and so, um, but yeah, they loved each other to death. They, um, they, even though they couldn't talk, they kind of had their own nonverbal language amongst them. But they cheated thing. together. Yeah. <laughs> I, can, I can imagine them plot, 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 plotting something against you guys. In <laughs> always. Always. <laughs> there was always an ulterior motive between the two of them. <laughs> I love it. Absolutely love it. Mm. Oh, you're going to make me tear up. Um, so... The two children are born and um, the children are growing up. And what, mm. before we get onto the little, the, the area where uh, we're approaching the 15 year mark for Zachary, um, mm -hmm. what did a day, because you changed your, you, you, you said earlier briefly, you, you changed your life. You stepped out away from your career. Mm. Why did you do that? Because initially I was in and out of the hospital so much that I had burned through all my personal time, all my sick time, all my, you know, you name it in the educational system. And I mean, I was almost working for free where I was at. <clears throat> yeah. And so um, it just got to a point where one day I called my wife and said, well, we had always talked about me staying at home. What are your thoughts on it? You know, and we talked a little bit about it and, you know, her ultimate response was you're never really prepared for it. It's just one of those things you got to kind of rip the bandaid off and do it. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I, I think I want to do it. And I said, even if it means leaving out in the middle of a contractual year, just because he's been in, in and out of the hospital uh, so much, which ironically, I'm glad I did because not, not a month after I left out, my son was back in the hospital for 12 days. Uh, so you know, after that conversation, it, that conversation was like on a Monday of that week. And by Friday of that week, I was walking out the door, having resigned uh, with all my things in a box driving home. Um, so that's kind of how all of that started. And then, you know, a normal day. Well, first of all, I will tell you, um, for those people that think that being a stay at home parent, we sit home and do nothing all day. Think again. And I, and I'm, I'm not even including the medical procedures that I had to do. Um, being at home, like when my wife has been the breadwinner at times, outside of doing the house stuff, I made sure that she was as well prepared and ready to go and lunch is made and all that kind of stuff for her to walk out the door so she wouldn't have to worry about it. So she could perform at her best at where she was at and not worry about what was going on at home. So that was a, a part of everything outside of the cooking, cleaning, inside work, outside work, taking care of the kids, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I stayed at home as well because I did all of the physical medical stuff. And when my kids got to a certain size, I was strong enough to lift them both, just being the male of the two of us. But a typical day would be, I would, you know, I'd get up at 6 a.m. I'd get the kids up by 6.30 a.m. I'd get them, you know, out of what they were sleeping in, get them, you know, because throughout their entire life, they, they wore diapers. So I would have to get them up, clean them up and change their diapers and, you know, get that changed and get them dressed. I'd get them in their wheelchairs, I, you know, uh, if, depending on what the weather was, you know, their coats on that kind of thing, get them in their chairs. I'd then get their, they wore AFOs, which are kind of ankle foot braces that they would wear to help with their stability. I'd get their um, AFOs on, I'd get their shoes on, I'd strap them in their wheelchairs. I'd get them out on the front porch. The, the lift bus would literally stop at my front door almost. I'd get them on the bus, they'd go off to school. And at that point, I'd get all the housework stuff done. And then you know, most days I'd have about an hour or two in the middle of the day where I could just sit and do nothing, if you will. Uh, uh, and then well about deserved. an hour, about an hour before um, they got home, I would start prepping for them coming home. Like I'd, I'd get their kind of lounge. If they weren't having a bath that night, I'd ha I'd get their loungewear out and kind of get all of their changing stuff out. And if if they were 
like even when my son had just a common cold, sometimes I would get out some of his respiratory machinery and kind of suction him out just as a precautionary thing right after he got home. Mm. Um, and so that would be kind of my afternoon routine and I'd make sure they would have their drinks and snacks and things going on, give them time just to decompress. Cause even though they have needs and maybe don't understand things like I would, you know, school's a long day, no matter how you look at it, kids need time just to kind of come in and just do nothing. Yeah. And so I'd give them time to play with their toys and have their drinks and that kind of thing. Then I'd get into dinner and, um, uh, then, you know, I'd lounge with them after dinner and I would get into prepping all of their medications cause they both took three or four medications a day, twice a day, every day. So I'd get all those prepped and then I would get into changing them once more before bedtime and I'd give them all their medications. And then I would put my daughter to bed first and get her going and, uh, I would then keep my son up for approximately about an hour after just to have one on one time with me or me and my wife and I'd put him to bed. And then at that point, you know, depending on if I was sleeping well that night, uh, you know, I'd either get in bed and kind of lounge for a little while and go to bed or I'd be up to whatever hour trying to get sleep. And then it would just rinse, cycle and repeat is what it would do literally every day, mm. you know, outside of those days where I'd keep the kids out of school and I'd have to drive to the north side of Atlanta and go see one of their six specialists is kind of how the, the normal routine went. Yeah. Wow. You did a, you did a, you did a beautiful job, Jason. I can, I can feel the connection that you definitely have with those children, especially uh, uh, prior for them to go into bed as well. It's um, mm -hmm. a much, much needed moment, isn't it? Especially after the, the what you have to do. And you, people don't think about the little things like what you said about even just getting, if he's got a cold, getting the, the, the machinery prepped as a precaution, mm -hmm. yeah. being proactive rather than reactive in mm -hmm. those moments as well is, is super important, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Zachary, Zachary unfortunately passed away uh, in the January correct. of 2022. Is that correct? Correct. January 28th, 2022. Talk to me about the days leading up to his death. Then, what did so? Uh, um, my son was definitely uh, he was susceptible to respiratory uh, related illnesses. However, in 2014, he had kind of a stomach reconstruction surgery, and ever mm. since he had had that, uh, his respiratory stays or even issues drastically dropped. Uh, part of it was because of the surgery. Part of it was because I, I was becoming more and more very proactive. And because I was becoming more proactive, the, the incidences were dropping. So three days before he passed away, both my kids had come home. I started the normal routine. Like I explained, you know, I made one of their favorite meals. They both ate like a horse. Uh, either you, you couldn't tell it by his side. He almost looked malnourished but he ate like a horse. He just could not keep weight on him for whatever reason. And so, um, I lounged with them for a little while. I got them ready. I put my daughter to bed the hour early as I normally do. Uh, I got him and brought him in the bedroom. My wife got home from work. And so we lounged for about an hour. So my wife went and got, he liked the electric toothbrush to brush his teeth because he had sensory issues. And so he just liked the vibration in his mouth. And so she went to go brush his teeth and, and she went in there and I think she went a little too far and like he, like he threw up a little bit. And so I, it, it surprised us a little bit, but we went, I looked and I said, well, you might've hit his gag reflex. There could have been something, you know, still in there. And whatever was in there came up, didn't think much about it. So we did that. We put him to bed. He got all excited, put him down. Well, that night he was up and down all night, which is unusual for him. And at this point, I, you know, I'm a stay at home parent. So I make the decision that morning uh, to let him rest. And I text his teacher cause he's in a self-contained classroom. And I say, Hey, Zachary is under the weather. I'm not sure what it is. I don't know if it's contagious. I'm going to keep him home because if he is contagious, I don't want to spread it to other medically fragile kids. And she goes, okay, just let me know. Uh, his, his teachers in the school were great about that. So we got my daughter ready, sent her off to school, got him up uh, about the normal time he gets up on the weekends. And um, 
so he's typically when you walk in, he gets real excited and bounces and he doesn't bounce a whole lot. And I just think, well, he's just tired. He didn't really sleep well the night before. And I get him in his favorite chair and I go, buddy, today's a lounge day. I know you're not feeling well. I know you haven't slept. If you want to take a nap, go for it. And so all day he refused to take a nap. And I kept saying to him, I said, buddy, you're not missing anything. I'm only sitting on my laptop doing, getting some work done. You're not missing anything. He still refused. And then he didn't really want to drink a whole lot that day, which didn't really surprise me because it had only been one day. Now, if it had gone into the second day, I'd have start been getting concerned because not wanting to drink something for any medical issue is a sign that something's going on. Mm. So, you know, he's there all day. He de- he doesn't pee a whole lot because he hadn't had a whole lot to drink. He hadn't gone number two either because he hadn't had a whole lot to eat. And so I make the, at this point, this, uh, the night he got sick was Wednesday night. I kept him home on a Thursday. At that point, I look at my wife. I said, I'm going to keep him home tomorrow. Something's, I said, he still doesn't look like he's feeling right. And I said, I don't want to send him to school for them just to send him back. Mm -hmm. And I said, Lord forbid, if something should really happen, I'd rather be around him making the decision than them making the decision. So. I put my daughter to bed at the normal time, put my son to bed at the same time because I figured he's just exhausted. Uh, put him down because I have baby monitors still in their room just so I can hear them in case something, you know, they're crying. You know, if something should perk my interest is the reason why I had it. And um, I put him to bed, I shut his door and he gets quiet immediately. And so I just look at my wife and say, you know, he's probably just exhausted. He didn't sleep well the night before. Didn't really want to take a nap. So maybe he's just exhausted. Same thing. I text the teacher said, hey, I'm going to keep him home on Friday, tomorrow on Friday. I said it'll butt up into the weekend. If he's not feeling well, he'll have the weekend to recover. Um, I said he'll be back on Monday. I said something's still not right. And she's just like, okay, just, you know, we look forward to seeing him on Monday. Get up the next day, get my daughter off to school. I walk in there, you know, his normal time and get up on the weekend. And he looks at me and he's, he gets a little excited. He's kind of, he doesn't really bounce a whole lot. I can look back and realize he's kind of a little lethargic kind of thing, but it doesn't dawn on me at that point. I walk over to the right side of his bed and he's got this dark green streak coming out of his mouth and, and not so much related to his condition, but just all the medical shows I've watched over my life. I went, Hmm, the only thing dark green in your system is bile and bile coming out of any part of you is not a good sign. So I get him up and he's floppy. Like he can't hold himself up. And that doesn't really strike me because there's been, there was a time or two in the past to where he had been that way. Like he had a respiratory related something and he just was really sick. So I go, hmm, something's not right. He he must be really sick. And so I get him out in the living room. I put him on the floor and I go through my medical protocol in my head. I give him a catheter. I don't get a whole lot of fluid out. He doesn't have a fever. Now, the one thing that does strike me is typically with the Ziegel Barrett syndrome, his midsection is kind of spongy because of just the organs and things. Well, I go to pre- touch his stomach, like to feel his bladder and it's rock hard like cinder block wall, brick, rock hard. And that catches my attention. And I go, well, this is very unusual. And so in my, even though things are going in real time in my brain, it's kind of slowing down so I can get a minute to kind of think of what I need to do. And it was honestly just a hunch. I went, you know what? I'm going to take him up to the hospital. I said, something's not right. I don't know what it is. I said, this is out of my wheelhouse. I'm going to take him up. And I said, I look at my wife and I get, as I'm getting him dressed, I said, probably what's going to happen. He's going to be sick with something. He's going to get admitted. We'll be there several days and then we'll come home. And she goes, okay. So I get him in his wheelchair, get him in the van and I get on the interstate from where I'm at. And I'm doing like 90 miles an hour up there. And while we're going up there, he, I think at this point he's, he's like falling asleep and waking up and I'm snapping my fingers. I'm going, Hey buddy, stay with, stay with me, stay with me. Just because like when you get a concussion, you don't want to fall asleep because of what falling asleep after having a concussion can do medically. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, after the fact, I realized he's fading in and out of consciousness is what it really is. 
And like there are times where he's lifting his midsection up as if, as if it's painful. And, and I don't realize it's that, I mean, in the moment, I think he's uncomfortable, but I don't know. I don't think it's like painful to him per se. Hmm. So I finally get up to the hospital. I get into the, you know, the parking deck and I go to get him out of his, out of his car seat to like into his wheelchair. And he's really floppy and it catches my attention. And I go, something's really not right. I get into the hospital. I go into the ER and, you know, a lot of ERs, I've got the line you've got to go through and I skip it to like go to the desk. Well, the security card walks over to me as if to like yell at me to get back in line. You know, what am I doing kind of thing? And I immediately look at him and go, I don't think he's breathing. I need help right now. And so he immediately changes his tune. He, he yells at the nurse. I've been in this hospital a hundred times, and this is the first time I have ever at a full run, run back into the ER into a trauma room. I mean, like running as fast as we can run to get back there. So we get into a trauma room and I instinctively unbuckle him from his wheelchair. I put him on the table that's in there and I back off in hopes that they're, they'll let me stay in there while they work on him because he's nonverbal and I can kind of tell him what's going on. Luckily they do. There's another trauma room that's open that, that they've got double doors next to it that's open that I can kind of back in and still watch what's going on. And so... I'm in there. They, they immediately start working on him. And the first thing that catches my attention is they, well, they cut his clothes off to get to him. And this guy walks over to his knee and right in the bone of the knee drills something into his knee. I later found out it was some sort of port to get medication in him. My son doesn't flinch at all. Now, most normal folks, if you drill something into your bone, you're going to come out of your skin because of just the level of pain that that is. And he never even flinches. And so it doesn't, the the reality of the situation doesn't quite dawn on me at this point. And so they're working on him for a few minutes and they start, they intubate him, which for those that don't know, that's where they put the tube down to get into your lungs so they can get air into your lungs kind of thing. And then they're doing that and they immediately start doing CPR, doing chest compressions. And at that point, the head ER doc walks over to me and goes, up to the minute, to the best of your recollection, how long has he been this way? And I tell her and she goes off and barks orders. And then she comes up back over to me. She goes, tell me this scenario in which the reason why you brought him up here today. And I tell him everything and she goes, okay. And she barks back orders. Well, they're doing chest compressions and they do that for about 10 or 15 minutes. And at that point they get, you know, the old, the old like electrical paddles where they used to like rub them together with gel on them and you know, clear. Well, today it's more of like pads that they stick on you in those areas. And it's like an Xbox looking machine that you press a button and it does its thing. So they do that on him and they yell clear and they hit the button and he literally raises off the table like you see in a medical drama. And I immediately look at the machine, the monitor with all of his vitals on because I've looked at it a thousand times with his respiratory related illnesses. And it literally goes boop and goes right back to what it's doing. And at that moment, I go, he's not coming back. Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.